Hello, my name is Jim. My amateur radio call sign is N2ADV. The following is a presentation on FT8, an amateur radio digital mode that has been out for a short time but has been taking the various bands by storm. So what is FT8? So on June 29th of 2017, there was an email out from Joe Taylor, K1JT, announcing the availability of a new mode in the WSJTX software suite called FT8. It was conceptualized by Joe Taylor and Steve Frank, K9AN, and developed by Joe, Steve, and the WSJTX development team. FT8 stands for Frank Taylor Design 8 FSK Modulation and is described by Joe Taylor as being designed for multi-hop sporadic E where signals may be weak and fading, openings may be short, and you want a fast completion of a reliable, confirmable QSL. So, though FT8 was designed for use on 10 meters and higher, initial tests of FT8 were performed on the HF bands with fairly good results. Here are some of the technical characteristics of FT8. I'm not going to get into all of these things. Um, you can read them at your leisure, but a couple of the things here uh, that should pop out is the transmission duration, which is 12.64 seconds. So there's 15 seconds overs with 12.64 uh, seconds of transmit. It's a few dB less sensitive than JT9, JT65, and QRA64, but it allows for completion of the QSOs four times faster. The bandwidth is greater than JT9, but about a quarter of a JT65A transmission and less than half of a QRA64 transmission. So what is FT8 really, with all of that stuff that I just said? FT8 is a faster, less sensitive cousin of JT65 and JT9. It allows for the exchange of very basic information like call sign, four character grid square, signal to noise reports within the 13 character limit, and it thrives in poor conditions when signals could be weak or inaudible to the human ear. Poor conditions could include band conditions, conditions imposed by antenna restrictions, so for those of us who live in an HOA and have an antenna in our attic, as well as external artificial noise sources. So for example, if your neighbor buys a very noisy plasma screen TV and it messes up your noise floor. To illustrate the bandwidth differences, here are three FT8 signals compared to two JT65 signals. What is FT8 not? FT8 is not a rag chew or conversation mode, and there aren't any plans to turn it into such a mode. You want to remember the previously mentioned 13 character limit. It's not intended for emergency communications. It's not as sensitive as JT65 and JT9. And it isn't everybody's cup of tea. Some people want to have that conversation. Some people would prefer talking through a microphone or using a CW key, um, using the other digital modes like PSK31 or Olivia. Um, so it's not for everybody, but the good thing about amateur radio is that there's something for everybody. Before continuing, I wanted to have a quick quiz. I'm going to show you some screenshots, and I want you to vocalize, at least to yourself, how much power you think each station is running. Some housekeeping items. All of these examples were from the 40 meter band in the same evening over the course of three consecutive 15 second cycles. Some were actually taken during the same cycle on a different part of the waterfall. All of the signals were from stations in Washington State as they were received here in the state of New York, and all of the stations both on the transmit and receive side were using vertical antennas. Here's example one. How much power do you think this station is running? This station was running 2.5 watts. How about this station? This station was running 100 watts. And this station? This station was running 850 watts, and before you lose your mind over this, stay tuned, and I'll get a little bit more into this over the next slides. And finally, this last station, how much power do you think this station is running? This station is running 5 watts. So how do they know how much power each of these people were running? Well, I set these examples up ahead of time. Um, I contacted the stations and had them chase some stations at set power levels so I could record the screenshots. So how many of the signals in the previous slides were overdriven? And this is in quotes for a reason. Well, the answer is not a single one of them. This is a screen grab of Smart SDR, which is direct sampled and shows the actual signals and not WSJTX's interpretation of the signals. I included the entire 5 kHz of passband plus or minus on both sides. 
Variations were made to the results on the previous slide in WSJTX simply by adjusting the audio input into the WSJTX program slightly. So that brings me to the waterfall. The waterfall display is one of the most misused features of WSJTX and many of the other digital mode programs that are out there. Because it visually resembles a pan adapter, the users often think that what they're looking at is an actual representation of the signal when it's simply a graphic representation of what the sound device is sending to WSJTX. As the waterfall display is dependent on the audio frequency or AF chain, there are dozens of variables on the receive end that can influence what is actually displayed. This means that the waterfall should never be used by itself to determine the quality of a received signal. The flattened checkbox being checked with improper audio settings is one of the major causes of irregularities in the appearance of signals on the waterfall. Now, if you uncheck the flattened box, there's a good chance your waterfall is going to turn bright red, and this is totally normal. Reduce the RF gain and audio input, and you'll soon see the display clear up. So above is a screen capture of 40 meters around uh, 0050 UTC on February 28th of 2018. You can see how at the bottom of the window, the signals kind of appear as red blobs. And as you get closer to the top, you can see where I reduced the RF gain just a little bit and the signal started to appear sharper and less blobby. You can see all the way to the right, a little bit above 3500 hertz, there's a JT65 signal where the impact was also similar to that. If you see a signal that you think is bad and you don't have a pan adapter, it's a good idea to try some of the following steps before assuming that the issue is on the transmit side. So first, reduce the RF gain. Disable the AGC if possible, especially if you are experiencing waterfall blanking. If you have a notch filter available, place it over the center of the signal in question. Reduce the AF gain. And if any of the above resolved the appearance of the signal in question, the issue is most likely on your receive end uh, as part of the receive chain and not the transmitting station. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't signals out there that have issues. There are certainly signals out there that have problems. In the following example, I have a station here on 40 meters that was running with compression and speech processing turned on, which was causing a significant distortion. Uh, it was going across 2 kilohertz of spectrum, rendering some of the weaker signals almost undecodable. So here's a picture from Smart SDR, and you can see here, and I'll circle it so you can see uh, the, the smudginess that goes across and uh, covers several of the weaker signals that you can see just below it. The audio input settings are extremely important with WSJTX and pretty much any other digital mode program out there. How signals appear and your ability to decode the weaker signals really depend on those audio input settings. When you're initially setting up the audio input level, it should be performed on the band on which you want to operate in a part of the band where no signals are present. Set the audio level so that the thermometer on the left side of WSJTX indicates around 30 dB. Between 40 and 60 dB is also okay, but keep in mind that once you start seeing some stronger signals on the band, you may experience some clipping. The indicator bar will be green when the audio level is at acceptable levels, red when audio clipping can occur, and yellow when the audio input is below acceptable levels. If you hover your mouse over the thermometer, you'll actually get a tooltip that pops up that gives you a translation of the colors in case you forget what they mean. Now, something to keep in mind is that the audio input settings are not a set and forget deal. A pretty much huge red flag for me is when somebody comes in and they ask a question about a change in their, uh, their user experience and they say that they've been using the same audio settings forever. The settings should be adjusted at the beginning of every operating session when you change bands and as propagation and band conditions change. So for the best results, you should be prepared to adjust the audio input settings and RF gain on the fly, and this could be in the middle of a QSO if necessary. Also, though it may seem counterintuitive, reducing the RF gain can help with decoding some weaker signals. You'd be surprised to see how many weak signals pop out of the noise once you start reducing the RF gain just a little bit. Also, the AGC should be set to off or fast if off is not available, and the RF gain should be reduced. Uh, once you turn off the AGC, you'll, you'll see the, the stronger input. And the reason for this is because the presence of a strong signal in the past band can cause your AGC to kick in, which can cause blanking of your waterfall. AGC action can impede your ability to hear some of the weaker signals. This brings me to the elephant in the room uh, that we hear an awful lot of, and that's power. How many of you have seen a signal and said, man, that guy is just running way too much power. Just look at how much that, that 
that signal report. And, and look how strong the signal is. And, and, and my goodness, look at the waterfall, that guy. Seriously, be honest. Uh, how many of you have done that? I know it's been, it's been a, a pretty common complaint. Here's the truth about power. And before I go on, uh, just a quick warning. This is usually where people get very upset at me. They often tune me out entirely because it challenges a very long-standing core belief that's been passed down for quite some time. And it's further propagated by internet sources such as YouTube and the other various websites that are out there. No, really, this has happened to me. Um, there, there's been a number of people who have gotten extremely upset with me. Here's the truth about power. Um, power by itself does not impact signal quality. A signal can be clean at 1 watt. It can, it can be equally clean at 1,500 watts. Remember that doubling the power level only adds about 3 dB, and this is using an ideal antenna in free space. In practice, it's often far less, and it can be slightly more if you're in the path of a directional antenna, but it's not as huge of an impact, I think, as a lot of people think. That means the difference between 5 watts and 100 watts is theoretically only slightly more than 12 dB, just the two S units, and the difference between 100 watts and 500 watts is only around 7 dB more. Now, that being said, garbage in, garbage out. If you feed a poor signal into a power amplifier, you'll get a louder poor signal back out. So this is where people have come up and said, but, but Jim says that everyone should be running legal limit with FT8. And people have actually said this both about me and or to me based on what I've said in the previous slide. So some things to consider about your power level. So as I noted in the previous slide, you're only getting about 3 dB increase by doubling your power level. So adding power is a game of diminishing returns. Since it's effective logarithmic, even at a legal limit of 1500 watts, you really haven't done a lot to your signal. So if you're running down the runway and you can visualize this, you quickly run out of tarmac before you actually get any major liftoff. In reality, with the AFSK digital modes like FT8, all an amplifier really does is make an inaudible signal only slightly audible, and that's if you're lucky, and a strong signal only slightly stronger. It won't, for example, take a minus 24 dB signal and make it a plus 24 dB signal. And intuitively, as radio amateurs, we know this, but um, it, you know, there's an, an awful lot of, of myth and lore out there about the impacts of power and how it uh, affects the signal that you see on the waterfall. Now, something else to consider is that a poorly tuned amplifier is never a good thing no matter the mode, but since most activity for modes like FT8 happen inside the span of an average SSB phone signal plus or minus a couple of kilohertz, your chances of making your neighbors very angry with a badly tuned power amplifier are a lot higher. So if you have a dirty signal coming out of an amplifier um, and it, it, it spreads, um, most of the impact is nearby your main signal, you're going to be making some very angry people if you have a mistuned amplifier. Um, duty cycle is also not an insignificant consideration. So as you increase your power level, you also significantly increase the heat generated by your equipment. Heat damage is cumulative. So something might not go pop right away if you're running 100 watts out of a 100 watt transmitter, um, but the heat generated by doing that can lead to the premature failure of very delicate and often very expensive PA components. So my almost final word about power here. Just like with any mode, you should be sure that your reach does not exceed your grasp. You don't want to become the proverbial alligator station with more mouth than ears. Doing so can lead to unintentional QRM to stations you might not be able to hear, but can certainly hear you. So when the question comes up, uh, and it often does, how much power should I run with FT8, or do I need an amplifier? Most often the answer is not very much. Um, it doesn't take a lot of power to make several contacts with FT8. Um, however, that being said, um, you shouldn't feel guilty if every once in a while you have to pop up the power to finish a QSO or to snag a particularly juicy DX. You aren't doing the damage that so many people think that you're doing just by running a little bit more power. You shouldn't make a habit of it. Um, <clears throat> as I noted earlier, the heat damage uh, is cumulative to your equipment. So the more often you do that, the more often you, you run the risk of harming your equipment. And um, again, running more power is not a massive game changer as a lot of people think that it is. Now to get into signal-to-noise reports for a moment, um, signal-to-noise reports are expressed as a signal-to-noise ratio, S slash N in dB, using a standard reference noise bandwidth of 2500 hertz. And this is quite important because when you're setting up your transceiver, you want to make sure that you set your filters, otherwise you're going to get some, some erroneous uh, readings on your signal to noise reports. FT8 and JT9 support the extended range of minus 50 to plus 49 dB and they assign more reliable numbers to fairly strong signals. For reference, JT65 reports range from minus 30 to minus 1 dB and the values are significantly compressed above about minus 10 dB. 
Signals become visible on the waterfall around minus 26 and are audible to someone with very good hearing, i.e. not me, um, around minus 15 dB. The thresholds for decodability are around minus 20 dB for FT8, minus 23 dB for JT4, minus 25 for JT65, and minus 27 for JT9. So um, here's an illustration that kind of gives you an idea about uh, an FT8 signal transmitted from station A, which will be this wonderful hex beam here, and received by other stations, stations B and station C. Um, something to consider, however, that the illustration assumes unchanging uniform propagation, which doesn't happen in real life. It also assumes that the ionosphere is a fairly flat surface and that everything bounces evenly, which again does not happen in real life. So in this picture here, you can see someone with a hex beam and they're putting on a signal from their station, which is the red arrow. Here's the signal from station A as it was received at station B, and here's station B's antenna. The blue rectangle represents the receiver range of station B, and each line represents 2 dB on the receive side. This purple line represents the local noise floor at station B. All these factors together show a received signal-to-noise report of plus 9 dB, assuming a 2.5 kHz bandwidth setting. So station B has a nice low noise floor, so the signal from station A comes through quite a bit higher than the local noise floor at station B. So the signal from station A reaches station C. This again represents the receiver range at station C. And again, each of these yellow lines represents 2 dB on the receive side. Here's the noise floor at location C. So you can see the noise floor is a heck of a lot higher here than it was at station B. Well, this person might live nearby in a subdivision where they have a lot more noise. Um, they could have um, a, a, a very poor receiver. They could have a, a several other issues that could lead to this. So all these factors together with the same signal show a receive signal to noise report of minus 9 dB. And again, assuming a 2.5 kilohertz bandwidth setting. So you can see with these illustrations an idea of how you are looking at the signals and how you're reporting them out. So signal reports are not absolute. Uh, they can change literally from second to second as the band conditions change, as local noise levels fluctuate, or even as the temperature of the receiver fluctuates. Signal reports represent an average signal to noise ratio over a given time period. In a 13 second period, even a relatively few rogue data points can skew the average. This may result in an artificially high or artificially low signal report. So um, you saw in the previous slide where I mentioned decodability levels, um, you could show a received signal report with a JT65 signal at minus 30 dB, for example, but um, it, it may or may not be correct based on the data that was received. And just because you see somebody at, say, plus 23 dB does not mean that that person is running a lot of power. It simply means you're receiving that signal above your local noise level. Uh, the following impact signal reports way more than power level. So propagation is the biggest impact to how you're receiving a signal. Receiver bandwidth, noise generated by the receiver itself. The antenna characteristics, if you have a beam and you're pointing in the direction of the signal you're receiving, or that person has a beam and they're pointing in your direction, it'll have an impact there. Uh, local noise, uh, RFI is a big one. QRM and QRN, uh, static crashes, things like that, the dynamic range of the sound card being used, and the sound card sample rate. Someone literally right down the street from you can give out a vastly different signal report from what you're giving out. Conversely, you can receive a signal from someone at one level and another signal from another person down the street uh, at, at the same power level, and you can actually give two completely different reports to those people, and they may seem like they've taken the same path, but they most likely have not. And here's a word about signal-to-noise reports from Joe Taylor. So K1JT sent out the following to the WSJTX email reflector after um, the dozenth or so message on the reflector with somebody being extremely excited about how great it was that they received a low signal report or they decoded a low signal report. So it's often accompanied by a screenshot showing them decoding a signal at minus 30 dB or minus 25 dB or something like that. And uh, he wanted to make sure that people were aware uh, of the following about signal-to-noise reports. And here's the note that he sent out. Perhaps this is a good time to remind everyone that estimates of signal-to-noise ratios for very weak signals always has an associated if unexpressed uncertainty. When signal-to-noise is quoted in dB, this can have important consequences. In a stoichiastic noise-like process, experimentally measured values will be scattered around the unknown true value. Some will be very accurate, some too high, and some too low. 
Suppose the signal's true signal to noise in the detection bandwidth is equal to 1. In a series of measurements of that signal, some of the estimated measured values will be close to 1. Some will be higher, some may be as high as 2 or maybe even more, and some will be as low as 0 or even less. These are the linear values of signal to noise, estimated ratios of signal power to noise power. When the signal to noise is expressed in dB, a logarithmic scale, you quickly see the problem. A perfectly plausible estimated signal to noise of 0.1 means that the dB signal to noise is at minus 10. At a signal to noise of 0, we get minus infinity dB. Some people think it's a big deal when they see a JT65 decode displayed with an estimated signal to noise dB of, say, minus 30 dB. This is nothing more than a statistical fluctuation of noise and an illustration of the nature of logarithms. This brings me next to the subject of the dreaded ALC, and this is a monster that seems to come up, up an awful lot, especially in the online forums and groups that are out there. So the automatic level control is one of the most generalized topics in digital modes, and this isn't just about FT8 or JT65. This is a carryover from the PSK days and some very old documentation that greatly overstated the one-size-fits-all approach of zero ALC as being the ultimate answer. The real answer to how much ALC your radio should indicate really depends on the design of your transceiver. Um, some radios will always show a little bit of ALC indication because of the design of the ALC circuit in the radio. You're totally fine, provided that the transmitter you're using does not generate spurs above a certain level. In fact, with some radios like the Elecraft K-Line, running with zero ALC can actually cause more harm than good, as those radios have a closed-loop power system. And the rig will actually power hunt in order to put out the user-selected power setting, and this can actually lead to a poorly modulated signal. That's why the manual says to have four bars showing with the fifth flickering if you look in the Elecraft manuals around on how to run digital modes. Now there's always going to be that one guy that says, but I run an Elecraft XYZ and I always run it with no ALC showing and it's fine. Unfortunately, it's only a matter of time before it isn't fine, especially if you hit the extreme edges of your bandwidth and you don't have the rig set up correctly with, um, with the cat control and split, which I'll get into a little bit later. Now, just to make sure that I level set here, this doesn't mean that you should not make sure that you're keeping your signal as absolutely clean as possible. You should adjust your ALC in such a way as to ensure that there's no clipping um, of your audio signal. However, how to do that depends on the design of your transmitter. For some radios, that is a zero, while for others, that's a percentage of the meter reading. And you want to consult the transceiver um, manual. And if you're unsure, often it's a good idea to contact the manufacturer. Um, you'll often see a post out there uh, on the various social media forums saying, hey, how much ALC should I run? And almost immediately there's a drive-by person that pops in and says, zero ALC is the answer to everything. And realistically, that, that isn't correct. Uh, some radios like the Flex Signature Series don't even have an ALC indicator. They have an audio output level indicator. And uh, setting that really depends on, um, on your setup, and you'll want to consult the instructions carefully there. That gets me to the often used uh, and overused term overdrive. Um, something to remember is it's actually quite difficult to overdrive an AFSK signal such as JT65, JT9, and FT8. Um, even though there's some very long-standing traditions on social media to start pointing fingers at other ops with ALC being sent around and brandied about like a sacred talisman, um, it's quite often one of those used words that says, hey, that person's running way too much ALC. Um, so I and several others have done some real-world tests with the all knobs to 11, and those of you who are older will recognize that reference, to see what the impact of the transmitted signal would be. And in each case, the result was a signal that was perfectly fine, viewed through a pan adapter display tied into the IS stage, or via direct sampling from the raw signal via an SDR. In fact, the signals actually appeared fine even on the waterfall display in WSJTX. The built-in waterfall, again, in WSJTX and many other digital mode programs was not designed to be used to measure signal quality. There are way too many variables in the audio frequency chain that impact the way that WSJTX interprets and displays. The waterfall really is just a convenience tool. It's intended to allow users to visually locate signals within the passband or to find the em an empty space where they can call CQ. And here's the big one is there's always that one guy that pops out and says, well, it's only one signal on the waterfall, so it must be that person's problem. Um, even if only one signal appears to be quote unquote bad on the waterfall, you can't determine if that one signal is poor just using the waterfall alone. And a reminder, you can't tell how much power somebody is running just by looking at their signal on the waterfall, not even using something like a pan adapter or by their signal report. If you looked at the previous slides, um, there's, there's you know, a lot of information there about the impact of power on the, uh, the effect of the signal. Um, 
just to give you an idea, I was on 20 meters running my FT817 at 2.5 watts, and I had some guy following me around saying too much power and high power lid uh, for about 20 minutes or so. Um, ironically, the person was coming in at plus 24 dB, so we must have had a pretty good path between the two of us. Um, I've also had signal reports at the minus 22 and minus 23 range running a few hundred watts uh, trying to complete a QSO. So it, it's there's a lot of factors that go into how a signal is received and what it looks like on your waterfall, and power is only the smallest fraction of that equation. So now we're going to get into the good stuff. We've gone into a high level of how FT8 works, as well as addressing some of the common misconceptions. Now let's talk about some of the operating basics of using FT8. What are you going to need to operate FT8? Well, the first thing you're going to need is a transceiver or a transmitter and receiver set capable of operating in combination as a transceiver. I've used my Kenwood 599 twins and my Heathkit SB301-401 twins once they've warmed up and the drift stops happening quite successfully on FT8. If you're planning on receiving only, you'll just need a receiver. A suitable antenna for the bands on which you intend to operate a computer running Windows, Mac OS, or Linux, and WSJTX. If you're a Windows user, you'll need a time synchronization client. That's especially important here. And I'll get into more about that in a little while. You'll need a sound card, and it's recommended that you use a separate sound card for data communication so you don't inadvertently send system sounds out over the air. If you're streaming music or videos um, or you have email running, you don't want to have those sounds going out over the air. It can actually cause quite a bit of havoc to other people within the passband. You'll also want some kind of isolation between the sound card and the computer. You don't want to connect the transceiver directly to the sound card without this isolation. Now there are some well-meaning videos and instructions out there showing people connecting their computers directly to their radios without any kind of isolation in there. Please don't do this as it can actually cause issues with ground loops and AC hum going out over the air and that can wreck an entire passband. There are some radios like the IC7300, for example, that have a built-in sound device, and you'll want to consult the instruction manual for your transceiver carefully to see how that works. The new Elecraft K3S has a built-in sound card, and older Elecraft K3s have built-in isolation. Some radios actually use a virtual sound card, like the Flex Radio, which uses the DAX virtual sound interface. Caffeine is recommended and entirely optional. Um, I've heard a number of people say, just one more contact and I'm going to bed, and five hours later they're still sitting in front of their radio and computer. So, um, again, here's a, a picture of what you'll need. So the computer, a sound device, uh, some kind of interface device, uh, a transceiver, and an antenna. And again, make sure that your system alerts, music, games, things like that are not using the same sound card that you're using for FT8 or any other digital mode for that matter. So here's WSJTX, and here's the window and some of its basic functions. So on the top, you have the waterfall and the spectrograph. Um, I keep my spectrograph fairly small. Um, it, this is totally user taste. This is the band activity window. So this is all the activity that's happening within your, uh, your filter settings of your band pass. Here's your receive frequency decode window, so where you have the green receive bracket that you can see at the top, um, and we'll get into a little bit more of that in a little bit, and this is just what you're seeing on that frequency. Here is the dial frequency. Um, in order to change this directly from the WSJTX window, you need to have a computer-aided transceiver control or CAT control to reflect the radio's frequency and to change bands automatically. Here's the QSO controls. Um, there's an alternative setup. There's a tab one and tab two. Um, later versions of WSJTX actually have a tab three for the expedition mode, which I'm not going to get into here. But um, you can see uh, the, the normal setup that under tab one, which is you know the very linear TX one, two, three, four, five, and six. But then you've got uh, on tab two the alternative controls for um, those of us who are used to the original JT65HF program, and it mimics that, and it's it's just entirely visual. Here are the audio frequency controls, so you can either change where you are by clicking on the waterfall, or you can use these controls in here. Here's the audio input level indicator, the thermometer that I talked about earlier in the presentation. And then the QSO details. This is the station that you are working, uh, and that person's grid. There's also an add and a lookup button. 
you've got the time slot selection on the clock, so TX even or first. This will automatically adjust depending on um, if you call a station calling CQ on evens, for example. Uh, this will automatically change to uh, uncheck this box. Or if you are trying to respond to a station that is calling CQ on odds, um, this will actually check the box. And by even and odds, um, we can get into that a little bit. But uh, the first 15 seconds is even, the second 15 seconds of a minute is odd, etc. And here's the CQ and auto sequence controls. And I'll get into the auto sequence in just a little bit as well. And then uh, the button bar here with the transmit and receive function buttons. So um, you've got the log QSO, the monitor button, uh, enable and halt TX. And then there's a, a box in later versions of WSJTX called CQ only. If you check this box, it will only display those stations calling CQ. The menus uh, box to the far right will uh, both show and remove the, uh, the file menu. And then the audio output level control. Um, this is for controlling the volume of audio out of the WSGTX program. When you're using modes like FT8, you're setting your radio to a single frequency, and the radio basically stays there unless you change bands. Now, there's some exceptions to this, which I'll get into in a couple of moments when I talk about things like split mode, but for the most part, your radio doesn't move. For example, on 20 meters, your dial frequency will show 14.074 MHz. The waterfall shows audio frequencies above the dial frequency in Hertz. This means that a waterfall frequency of 1000 Hertz and a dial frequency of 14.074 MHz puts your actual transmitted signal on 14.075 MHz. I'll get into why this is important as well in a moment. It helps to think of the waterfall as a musical staff, where the higher the waterfall frequency, the higher the note. This also becomes important on the next slide. You may notice that your power output level changes when you're at the high end or low end of the waterfall. You'll see your ALC indicator or your power meter bounce around a little bit when you hit the high end and low end of your waterfall. This is because you're hitting the transmit filter on your transmitter. And there's an easy fix for this if you have cat control. But first, I want to get into the reasons as to why this happens. So on the previous slide, I mentioned that you should look at the waterfall like notes on a musical staff. You have some low notes at the bottom and you have the higher notes at the top. Now I want you to sing, and since this is one way, the only person that can hear you will be yourself or people around you. Um, and again, only if you really want to. And it, it helps to visualize uh, if you can actually hear it as well, but it's totally up to you. Start in the middle of your vocal range and then go up to scale. You'll keep singing higher and higher, and eventually you'll hit the limit of your vocal range, and your power will roll off as you hit falsetto, and eventually it'll roll off completely when you get too high. Now go the other way. Start at the middle of your range and then keep going lower and lower and lower. You'll eventually bottom out your vocal range and when you get too low, you'll fade out altogether there as well. There's a fix for this. So if you're singing and you find notes that are too high or too low fairly often, what do you do? You change the key. You adjust the range of notes to fit comfortably within your vocal range, keeping the notes where you can sing them. This is where the fix comes in. You can use the split setting in the rig control settings to help. Think of the fake it or rig split functions the same way. When you transmit, your radio will change the dial frequency to move your transmitted signal to the middle of your transmit filter. You're essentially changing the key of the staff to keep the notes where your radio can sing them. Just a note about those, rig uses two VFOs um, with the rig and split, and the mode fake it only uses one VFO but alters the dial frequency during transmit periods. Now, when that happens, don't panic. Um, with this solution, when you see the frequency change, this is not a bad thing. Uh, even though your rig frequency changes, WSJTX keeps your signal on the exact same spot where you had it on the waterfall. So the person on the other end is not going to know that your dial frequency is changing. Um, worth noting is that this fix also presents signal quality issues from uneven, po uneven power delivery. So it's actually very recommended. Um, when you hit the high end and low end of your transmit filter, you can actually create spurs as a result of that. So this actually doesn't just help with keeping your power delivery even, it'll keep your signal cleaner as well. So using the waterfall, if you look at the top of the waterfall display, as well as the frequency column and the TX and RX indicators, you'll see some numbers. Those numbers represent your position along the passband in hertz or cycles, and your position in relation to the carrier frequency if the carrier are not suppressed since we're using single sideband. So why is this important? So what? Well, digital activity isn't just confined to FT8 on the various bands. 20 meters, for example, has a lot of digital activity packed into a very small area. That means if you decide to move up or down the waterfall, your transmitted signal may interfere with somebody else. Close to zero, for example, you may find some modes like Olivia or some of the other exotic digital modes that are out there. And then 
similar to JT65A, a signal may actually be there even though you don't see or hear it. On the other end of the spectrum, we have JT65, which is still going strong. Remember that this activity starts around 14.076, so if you start firing off on FT8 on 20 meters above 2,000 hertz indicated on the waterfall, you're actually crossing into the JT65 watering hole, and you actually may be wrecking a contact for someone else. And though it may appear clear, um, remember that I mentioned earlier that those modes are actually a, a little bit more sensitive, so they actually may be further into the noise, and you may actually be causing some issues. Nobody likes to be stepped on, um, and it's a good idea to not be the person that steps on others. Even though it may appear clear, it probably is not. Over the next several slides, I'm going to get into some basic operating practices, and I'll start with the standard CQ format. In order to be properly recognized by WSJTX, CQ calls need to be in a set format, which allows users to click on that CQ in order to respond. Please note that this applies not just to FT8, but also the other modes within WSJTX suite, including JT65, JT9, QRA64, etc. The first one that you'll see, and probably the most common, is the basic CQ followed by a call sign and a four-character grid. So for example, if I plug in my call in grid, it would read CQ N2 ADV FN23. The next one is more complex, and this is used for directed CQs. So CQ followed by a two-letter combination, AA through ZZ, followed by a call sign and a grid. So again, if I plug my call sign in grid as well as a two-character combination, you can see the example here, CQ, ND, N2, ADV, FN23. In this example, I'm letting people know that I'm looking for the state of North Dakota, not that I'm calling from the state of North Dakota. So wait, I thought I said that those modes have a 13 character limit. If you count CQ N2 ADV with the ND and the FN23 and all the spaces, this has 16 characters. What's the deal? So the format indeed appears to exceed the 13 character limit. So again, if you include the spaces, it appears to have 16 characters. However, this is actually accomplished through some creative uh, programming where you compress the values together and then they get translated back out into the proper format on the receive end. The actual message transmitted doesn't actually exceed the 13 character limit. This is also one of the reasons why older versions of WSJTX are not recommended for use on the air, as some of the compression methods were not yet available when those older versions of WSJTX were released. This workaround method is also used for compound call signs, so for example, VE3 stroke N2 ADV. Although, in order for this to work, the call sign must follow a specific format. Further information about what call sign formats are supported are available in the WSGTX manual, which can be found by pressing F1. CQ formats like CQ USA N2 ADV or CQ Asia N2 ADV will not allow other users to click on the CQ to respond, and it's only going to frustrate other people. In addition, if the other users have the show DXCC and work before status function enabled in the WSJTX settings, it'll actually show the incorrect DXCC information. So for example, CQ Asia N2 ADV will show up on their screen as Pakistan in the DXCC field. So this actually does a lot more harm than good. Trying to call for multiple states like CQ, ND, AK, and HI, and 2 ADV, and I've seen this an awful lot, will also not allow users to click on your CQ to respond. So people who are in North Dakota, Alaska, or Hawaii are actually going to have to manually type in your call to respond, and most people aren't going to bother. They're going to move on to other stations that they can more easily answer. FT8 follows the standard exchange protocol for a QSO. From the WSJTX user manual, and here's a quote, by long-standing tradition, a minimally valid QSO requires the exchange of call signs, a signal report or some other information, and acknowledgements. WSJTX is designed to facilitate making such minimal QSOs using short, structured messages. The process works best if you use these formats and follow standard operating practices. The recommended basic QSO goes something like this. CQ K1ABC FN42. This is K1ABC calling CQ, including their call sign and a four character grid. K1ABC G0XYZ I091. G0XYZ is answering with a call sign and a four character grid. G0XYZ K1ABC minus 19. This is K1ABC sending the report of minus 19 to G0XYZ. K1ABC G0XYZ R minus 22. This is G0XYZ, we're sending a report plus an R, and the R means I acknowledge your report, here's your report in return. So this is an acknowledgement of the minus 19 that he just received. 
G0XYZ, K1ABC, RRR. This is K1ABC sending the G0 station a Roger report received, which is also translated as Roger, Roger, Roger. K1ABC, G0XYZ73. G0XYZ sends a 73. And this is where the example QSO in the manual ends. A final 73 from the CQing station is optional, but is actually not required. There is a convenience feature built in where the user can have a log dialog pop up and prompt the user to log the QSO after the 73, or the QSO can be logged manually at any time. This prompting to log the QSO was placed as a convenience and is not really supposed to say, here's when a QSO actually has to be logged. You don't want to be this guy here just because the band fades. You can see on the right side of the picture, there is an RRR and then the other station sending 73, followed by an RRR and a 73 and an RRR and a 73 and an RRR and a 73. So you want to basically use some common sense here, and eventually you'll just want to log the QSO and move on. During the development of FT8, it was noted that the reaction time before the next transmit cycle begins is fairly tight. While being developed, the transmit period was 13.48 seconds, and though this was later reduced to 12.64 seconds, the reaction time is still only slightly over 2 seconds. This reaction time, which I'll call the human factor, along with the differences in computer abilities like processing speed, led the team to develop the auto sequence option. The auto sequence requires a human to start the QSO, typically by responding to a CQ. Once this happens, if the other station decodes the response and the other station has the auto sequence and call first enabled, it begins the QSO sequence automatically and will continue until the operator discontinues the process, the program hits the watchdog timer, or the sequence runs to conclusion. The WSJTX team wanted to make sure that they did not create an automatic QSO machine, so human interaction is required to begin a QSO as well as to log the QSO. Also, please remember it's the user, which we'll call the control operator, and not the software that determines if a QSO is complete. In an earlier slide, I talked about the word split when I was referring to the radio changing the dial frequency to keep your transmitted signal in the center of your transmit filter, and that prevented power roll-off and signal quality issues when you were transmitting at the high end and the low end of the waterfall. I want you to set that aside for just a moment, because when we're talking about split on the waterfall, it actually means that the audio frequency of your transmitted signal is different than the audio frequency where you're receiving. Think things like up in a CW or phone pileup, but instead of having different frequencies on the dial, you actually keep your dial frequency the same and just your position in the passband changes. This is accomplished by a combination of keyboard and mouse commands. These commands can be found by pressing F5 while running WSJTX. It's also worth noting that you can hit F1 at any given time and the user guide will pop up with all this information as well. This is the window that pops up when you hit F5, and you can see that there is the list of keyboard and mouse commands that you can put together in order to move the uh, frequency around, as well as some other things. The transmit and audio frequencies in this example, which is me going after uh, another station, uh, you can see my transmit and receive audio frequencies are different, but my dial frequency remains the same. So in this case, my transmit is on 609 hertz, and my receive is at 708 hertz. You can see above where this actually worked with me getting Hawaii, uh, where he was transmitting a little over uh, 1100 hertz, and I was actually down below 1000. And then when I went after the... Uh, the HC5F station, I tried various different places throughout the band where they couldn't get him. He just wasn't receiving me. I wanted to take a moment to talk about one of the most important factors that's out there when it comes to setting these modes up, and it's about time. Time synchronization is absolutely critical to ensure that their proper decoding or any decoding at all happens. I made a brief reference at one point about evens and odds, where the first 15 seconds of a minute are even, the second 15 seconds are odd, etc. And in order for the system to work and for the decoder to work properly, all the stations have to be on the same time constant. The threshold for time synchronization is about 2.6 seconds before decodes start to drop off entirely. I have found that decoding starts to degrade a little bit uh, after 1.2 seconds of difference. So if I'm working another station and their station is 1.2 seconds or more off, I find that the decodes are actually hit and miss. The built-in internet time synchronization facility in Windows is not sufficient to maintain an adequate time synchronization. There are a number of free programs out there that will sufficiently synchronize your computer clock. Dimension 4, BKT, TimeSync, Mindberg, and a bunch of other ones that are out there. When you're operating in a field away from an internet connection, there are several methods to achieve time synchronization. You can manually adjust your time using WWV. 
you can use a small GPS USB dongle um, and a compatible program such as BKT TimeSync. These can be found on the various websites, um, like your, our, our favorite auction websites and or other ones, for about 9 or $10 US. And you can use internet time sync using a cellular internet connection, but this also uses your cellular data. Now I wanted to get into some companion tools that can be very helpful for things like FT8. Philip Gladstone N1DQ has a website, pskreporter.info, that shows the reception of signals in various digital modes. That can be FT8, JT65, JT9, etc. And these are all displayed on a map. The information allows users to check propagation and see how they are being received in different areas. Reporting to PSK Reporter is entirely optional. It can be enabled in WSJTX by going into the settings, clicking on the Reporting tab, and checking the box next to Enable PSK Reporter Spotting under Network Services. Philips' website has a ton of stuff out there. Um, I can't even begin to scratch the surface. There's way too much to list even here. I would encourage you to go out and take a look at it. There's a lot of data for people to look at. Here's what it looks like, and you can see I've got some of the options under Display Options Permalink enabled, like the Day-Night Terminator, as well as Signal to Noise. But you can see where my signal has been received uh, within 24 hours on 20 meters. Another great add-on program for WSJTX is JT Alert. At this time, it's Windows, um, as of the time of this presentation. This is by BK3AMA and can be found at hamapps.com, and this allows for logbook integration and award tracking, including needed states, DXCC entities, and grids. You can see in my example here, I've got some different color coding, which is all user selectable. JT Alert will provide audio and visual alerts for needed entities, and you want to make note of the fact that if you want to use the audio alerts, you want to use a separate sound card to make sure that these audio alerts don't go out over the air. There's a built-in UDP, User Datagram Protocol service, in JT Alert that allows the user to click on the call signs in JT Alert, and this will translate over to WSJTX and begin the transmission sequence. So I have coded in blue CQ for wanted grids, and in this screenshot that I have here, I have K1HTV from Virginia calling CQ. If I were to click on that call sign in JT Alert, it'll actually start the transmit sequence in WSJTX, and I can respond to him from there. JT Alert also has a function that allows the user to create pre-made freeform text macros that can be sent to WSJTX quickly. Variable fields such as call sign are inserted in JT Alert by predefined characters like the at symbol for call sign. JT Alert also has an optional feature that allows users to send short messages back and forth to one another. And this is very helpful when steering around QRM, like can you move up 70 or 80 hertz. This does require an internet connection to work. Now, not all JT Alert users have this function turned on. Uh, it is enabled by default, but it can be shut off in the settings. Another great service that comes along with JT Alert is hamspots.net, which is an extension of JT Alert. Users of JT Alert can select the option to send decode data or spots to Hamspots so other users can use that information to see where their signal is being heard. Hamspots also allows for chatting via the internet with other users for SCEDs, real-time discussions on changing band conditions, QRM, and things like that. It'll also show reception details such as the time difference between your signal and the clock on the receiver's end. This can be really handy if you're trying to track down uh, any issues, uh, troubleshoot any problems, and see why either people are not responding to your CQ or you can't get stations to respond to you when you respond to their CQ. Here's the main page for uh, hamspots.net for FT8, and there's uh, different pages for the various modes that are out there. And you can see this, the chat box here as well as the cluster spots. If you go into the details for spots for you and what you've sent, you can see I don't have any spotted on here because I did not have it turned on at the time of the screenshot. But on the right-hand side, you can see all the stations that spotted me. And you can see the time difference between myself and the other stations. So, for example, AH0U, at the time that I took this screenshot, had re received my station three minutes prior at a signal strength of minus 06, but there was a 1.1 second time difference between myself and him. If you look at the other... Uh, time codes on there. I was a little bit far off from some of the other stations, but uh, for the most part, I was pretty much uh, within the range for decodes. So either his was off a little bit more or I had jumped up and down a little bit. You can also see the spot source. So on the left-hand column, it'll tell you uh, the various uh, programs that have sent the spots to uh, handspots.net. You can see the spot age and the details of the spotter. 
the country and state if applicable. The band in question. The mode, like I said, this will do other modes like JT65 and JT9. The signal to noise report or uh, S slash N and DB. And the time difference. Note that with both PSK reporter and ham spots, the reported band may be inaccurate. So if you see yourself spotted on 20 meters, for example, and you've only been calling CQ on 17 meters, if the spotter isn't using cat control, i.e. they're using manual rig control, and they fail to select the appropriate band drop down in WSJTX when they change bands, they may report the wrong band. So don't panic. If you're interested, here are the various sources used throughout the document. A very important one here is the WSJTX user manual. Um, this can also be found by pressing F1 when you're running WSJTX. There's a lot of information there, um, and you'll want to use the manual version that is compatible with your current version. So for example, I'm running WSJTX 1.9 as of the recording of this. The link I had here was, uh, was for 1.8, which was the current general availability release out there. Thank you for watching. Um, I appreciate you sticking around for this long. I know this is a very long presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to stop by the Facebook group, which is the FT8 Digital Mode Experimental and General Use Group, and we'll be happy to help you. Thank you, and 7-3.